Uh, good morning, everyone, and can I welcome you to the 24th meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent mode so they don't disrupt uh, the proceedings of the meeting? We've got apologies this morning from Jeremy Balfour, who unfortunately cannot be with us. Uh, we're hoping Gordon Linders will, will, will be along to join us at some point. I know he's been delayed in, in, in relation to that, uh, and hopefully... Uh, We'll have a full compliment uh, in, in due course at, at the meeting, but we're not quite there yet. And we move to agenda item one, which is decision to take uh, an item in private. And the committee is asked to agree that item four, consideration of evidence, is taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? Yeah. Thank you. We now move to agenda item two, uh, social security and in work poverty. And this is the final evidence session of the committee's inquiry into social security and in work poverty. Um, and can I welcome Shirley Ann Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, uh, Alison Byrne, Deputy Director, Reserved Benefits Division, and David Souter, Head of Fair and Inclusive Work Practices, Scottish Government. Thank you all three of you for joining us this morning for this final evidence session. And could I ask the Cabinet Secretary, who I know has got an opening uh, statement for us this morning, to to deliver that now, thanks. Okay, thank you, good meter, uh, convener, and good morning. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to be here today. This inquiry is extremely timely, and I've been following your evidence sessions with great interest. Only last week, the UN's Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights highlighted significant concerns about levels of poverty in the UK, and the Scottish Government shares these concerns including the devastating impact that UK government welfare cuts are having on Scotland's people and communities. Where we can, we are taking decisive action across a wide range of areas to lift people out of poverty in Scotland, and I would like to say a few words about this today. For most people, work remains the only viable path out of poverty, yet simply being in employment is no guarantee. As the committee will no doubt have heard, the majority of children and working-age adults in poverty live in working households. Between 2014 and 2017, 66% of children in relative poverty after housing costs and 59% of working-age adults in poverty were living in a working household. When DWP officials gave evidence to your inquiry recently, they stated that full-time work virtually eliminates the risk of in-work poverty. This, they explained, was the rationale underpinning universal credit. Our own evidence, however, suggests something very different. For example, over a third of children in poverty in Scotland, that's 100,000 children, live in families where at least one adult is in full-time work. It is unacceptable that in the fifth richest country in the world, people are struggling to put food on the table, food bank use is on the rise, and working families are having to choose between eating and heating their homes. The Scottish Government is using our full range of devolved powers to provide additional support where we can to both mitigate the impacts of welfare reform and support people on low incomes. Across other ministerial portfolios, we are providing £750 million in an Attainment Scotland Fund to help close the poverty-related attainment gap in our schools, delivering free school meals uh, for primary one to primary three children, giving families an annual saving of around £380 per child, delivering a school clothing grant where eligible families will receive at least £100 to cover costs of school uniforms, increasing our Fair Food Fund to £3.5 million in 2019-20 to support dignified responses to food insecurity, focusing £2 million to support families during school holidays, extending access to free sanitary products to low-income women and girls, providing £3.3 million over 2018-20 to provide financial health checks to low-income families and older people to help reduce costs and maximise incomes, and since August 2017, every newborn in Scotland has received a baby box. Scotland is the only country within the UK with statutory targets to ultimately eradicate child poverty. The Child Poverty Delivery Plan, published in March, was backed by a multi-million pound package of investment, including a £50 million pound tackling child poverty fund. We believe that sustainable and fair work is a long-term route out of poverty for families, so we are taking action to support parents to work and earn more. Over the next three years, we will be working to lift at least 25,000 more people onto the living wage through our work to build a living wage nation, 
<coughs> Likewise, we are using our limited employment support powers. We, um, we launched Fair Start Scotland, our new employability service, in April 2018, which is estimated to positively impact around 7,000 children living in poverty by placing their parents into fair work. And we will also invest £12 million to help unemployed parents move into work and parents in work to build skills, progress and earn more. Your inquiry is rightly focusing on universal credit and the damage this is causing. It is impossible to speak about in-work poverty without mentioning the impact of UK government welfare reforms and the introduction of universal credit. There is a mountain of evidence that universal credit is pushing people into poverty rather than helping them out of it. The UK Government has consistently ignored calls from the Scottish Government, from charities and from the third sector organisations to halt the rollout of universal credit until improvements are made. They have also ignored the findings of the National Audit Office. It remains to be seen whether they will now ignore the damning findings of the United Nations Special Rapporteur, who said that, although its initial conception in its initial conception, it represented a potentially major improvement in the system. It is fast falling into universal discredit. I know that the Trussell Trust provided evidence to the committee on the 52% increase in food bank use um, in areas where universal credit has been rolled out for 12 months or more. The report goes on to predict that as managed migration rolls out, demand on food banks will increase. Additionally, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation is clear that the single biggest cause of the rise in child poverty across the UK is the UK Government's welfare policies. The Scottish Government's 2018 Welfare Reform Report highlighted that in 2020-21 it is estimated that an annual social security spend in Scotland will be around £3.7 billion lower than it otherwise would have been as a result of UK Government cuts. The report also states that since the benefit cap was lowered in 2016, around 3,500 Scottish households have been capped each month. This policy has disproportionately affected families with children. Of those families who have been capped, 89% contain children and 64 are lone parent households. In the face of this massive reduction in spending, the Scottish Government expects to spend over £125 million in 2018-19 on welfare mitigation measures and measures to protect those on low incomes. This is over £20 million more than the previous year and £40 million more than the year before that. Since October 2017, the Scottish Government has been using its powers to give people in Scotland the choice to receive Universal Credit Award either monthly or twice monthly and to have the housing costs in their Universal Credit Award paid direct to the landlord. This is helping to people on low incomes to better manage their budget. However, the Scottish Government is not here to paper over the cracks of the UK Government's welfare reforms. We simply cannot afford to cover the costs of welfare cuts, which amount to billions of pounds per year in Scotland. This is equivalent to three times our annual police budget or the entire annual budget of both NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and NHS Lothian. In the end of his visit statement, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights said that it's outrageous that devolved administrations need to spend resources to shield people from government policies. Whilst the majority of Social Security is still reserved to the UK government, it therefore has a duty to ensure that that system operates as a safety net, protecting those who need it most and preventing people from being pushed into poverty and destitution. Amber Rudd has said this week that she wants to have a fair, compassionate and efficient benefit system. And I have written to her about these issues that we are currently facing and hope that this commitment will lead to a change in course from the UK Government. Thank you for your time and I'd be delighted to take your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, there was a lot in that. Um, th th there is a focus to this inquiry. Um, Yes, we've looked at universal credit and we've strayed into parts of universal credit that isn't necessarily related to in what <coughs> poverty, and I think that's understandable given what many of us would see as the car crash happening in front of our eyes in relation to, to the rollout of that. But there's almost like a, a slow-moving car crash potentially in relation to future actions under universal credit, and that is uh, the migration of those... In, in work benefits such as uh, tax credit entitlements into the universal credit system. And that certainly raised quite a lot of concerns. I'm sure you'll be aware that the DWP's policy intent is to put conditionality 
uh, on those who are currently receiving tax credits when they move into universal credit, and that being that um, a lot of low-paid, vulnerable workers supported in employment will have to either increase their hours or increase their rate of pay uh, to make sure that they are not sanctioned or penalised in some way uh, whilst still actively in work. Can I maybe start off by asking your, your comments on how workable you think that system will be? Well, I think just to, to touch on uh, one of the, the first aspects that you mentioned there around the managed migration onto universal credit, this is an area which is causing extreme concern given the, the sheer number of people that will be involved in it. Um, this is still due to, to begin in the summer of next year, and there's a great concern, not just from the Scottish Government, but from others, that that managed migration will begin to roll out, despite the fact that we know uh, from the evidence, as I said in my opening statement, that there are a, a great uh, a number of problems with universal credit. One of the challenging aspects of that in particular will be that many people will move into the benefit system for the first time. Um, they will not, under the current regulations, um, um, move forward automatically. They will need to apply for their universal credit. Um, and therefore, there is um, a great deal of concern that particularly some of the most vulnerable people um, will, uh, be, will miss out and will not know that they are required uh, to move over. So there is a, a number of concerns about managed uh, migration and the people that will be coming into the benefit system for the first time. Uh, particularly around their awareness of sanctions and um, the impact that that will have. Um, you mentioned, Convener, in particular, the work that we will have to do on those that are in work condition, um, those uh, that will experience in work conditionality, and that is a, a great concern. Um, we may come back at some point to, to, to discuss um, the effectiveness of sanctions and conditionality. In, in the round, but the, the new policy from the DWP to um, sanction those who are not doing as they see it enough to get it increased hours or to move to a, a higher paid job um, really doesn't take into account the actual individual circumstances of the people that are, are involved, uh, the local labour markets, uh, the fact that there may not be uh, uh, higher paid jobs for people to move to, uh, that they simply can't magic up extra hours uh, to, to, to go into at that point. So there is a, a great concern just in particular around the in-work conditionality and how that will affect people. I mean, I'm certainly worried about uh, constituents of mine who are out there busting a gut just now, uh, part-time hours, minimum wage, to be a role model to their children, for example, to go out to work and and, and, and show them the, the, the benefit uh, of, of work for households who will be told that they're not working enough hours or they're not earning enough money, and that's somehow uh, their fault. Russell Gunson from the IPPR told the committee uh, the idea that it is the sole responsibility of the claimant to increase their hours or earnings to satisfy the universal credit system bears no relation to reality. So th that's what this committee was told. So I'm wondering what the reality is. Uh, so we know the reality is that there will be conditionality on um, in-work uh, claimants um, to increase their hours or increase their rate of pay, and that Job Centre Plus and DWP will have to decide what an appropriate increase of hours would be or increase in pay would be. Now, Scott, there's a shared space here, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So. Uh, the UK government has that policy intent, and they would talk about uh, work progression in relation to that. But the Scottish government uh, and local authorities, as part of that shared space, have things like Skills Development Scotland. The local authorities have got various agencies that they use to support um, upskilling uh, a workforce and support, not least of all, childcare uh, support, uh, for, 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 for example. So I'm just wondering that being the case, what discussions has there been between the UK government, the Scottish government and local authorities in terms of how you can operate within that shared space to support work progression for 
constituents that we all represent uh, to avoid them being at risk of sanction. So has there been discussions around that? Well, there are discussions around the um, aspects that are now devolved to the to the Scottish Government, so around employability, and uh, both myself and uh, Mr Hepburn as the relevant minister um, attend, for example, a joint ministerial working group where aspects can be discussed. But that's specifically around the areas that are devolved. Um, the, the, the wider aspect around how we can um, have awareness of what the DWP are, um, is planning um, it would be fair to say is, is not at such a, a good stage. The DWP, for example, don't proactively um, share their thinking along aspects to do with in-work conditionality. So there is um, an imperative upon the DWP to share that information uh, timiously. Um, we will, um, when it comes to sanctions, for example, uh, never agree that that is an effective or useful um, policy that we should go around. But we certainly need to be aware of what the DWP's intentions are, uh, so that uh, both the Scottish Government and, as you mentioned, local authorities and Scottish Government agencies have full awareness of that and can adapt um, accordingly. So there are certainly um, areas around in-work conditionality, as an example, where there, there does need to be a, a greater sharing of information from the DWP so that we can uh, be sure about the impacts that it will be having um, up here. But I would, of course, make clear that the, the Scottish Government, uh, within its work on employability, uh, does not support uh, sanctions, um, has never believed that sanctions um, are an effective um, way of encouraging or forcing people in to work. And indeed, the evidence has shown that in-work conditionality um, is not effective. The National um, Audit Office, for example, uh, was particularly um, concerned around that. So we will continue to have that um, policy disagreement with the UK government around uh, the, the use of sanctions, both in in-work conditionality and indeed further within the welfare system. I, I mean, that was a lengthy and detailed and helpful answer, but I suppose at the heart, I, I suppose th th this doesn't require a, a lengthy answer, Cabinet Secretary, but at the heart, what I'm asking, has there been any specific discussions about what progression, what progression would look like uh, between the Scottish Government and the UK government, given the shared space and the various agencies that would have to support that kind of career or work progression? Has there been any conversations at all in relation to that vis-a-vis -vis universal credit and the benefit system? I've certainly not um, seen the, the detail on um, the, that's emerging on the DWP's thinking on work um, progression, but I'd be happy to provide the committee with further information um, in writing when I can check with officials to which extent that, that detail has been going on. It's not an area, obviously, that sits within my remit um, in particular, so we can ensure that uh, the extent of that uh, discussion um, can be furnished to the committee in due course. Final, um, uh, lots of members want to come in and we take in the but the last thing I want to ask, because I just want to put in the record that Pete Thero from the WP, when we were asking about in-work conditionality, or as I like to call it, sanctioning people who are actually going out to do a day's work, quite frankly, because that's what we're talking about, uh, said, uh, we are very clear that this policy uh, is still being developed. We need to do a lot more research before we can see what the best way forward is on this. So, what would your comments be, irrespective of what level of discussion there has or hasn't been between the Scottish Government and the DWP, uh, should there be a formal process of engagement in relation to these discussions? And should there be some form of joint sign-off or protocol in relation to what um, what progression would look like and how that interacts with the benefit system, given that shared space where the Scottish Government has responsibility for upskilling through the college sector and education more generally. Local authorities have got a responsibility in relation to childcare and in other ways 
yet the DWP, it's like a three-legged stool here, but the DWP are forging ahead in relation to saying what work progression will look like. Um, does there not have to be some form of formal protocol around what the reality of that is? So the Russell Gunston's comment that I started off with, that this bears no relation to reality, uh, can be fixed. Well, I, we would certainly encourage and, and have um, encouraged the DWP to look at widening the um, meetings that already take place in official level around, for example, employability, to widen that out to include the, the issues that you've mentioned. Um, and, of course, both Mr Hepburn and myself um, would um, look to have similar uh, wider discussions within the joint ministerial uh, working group. So there's certainly um, no uh, barrier from the Scottish Government's point of view of wanting to try and um, encourage uh, a, a realisation of, of what actually is happening within the labour market in Scotland and the impact um, or the potential impact of the in-work conditionality that DWP are suggesting. Thank you very much. Uh, lots of bids for supplementaries. I want to just give a name check to people who have caught my eye. And I'm one minute to get in the deputy convener in a second. But I've also got Alistair Allen and Shona Robinson who want to come in this area. Uh, Polly McNeil. Um, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so the convener um, talked at length about um, the transfer of uh, tax credits to the benefit system, which, as we've established, probably still be a shock to a great number of people who, as you say, have not been involved in the benefit system. Um, in your view, Cabinet Secretary, um, is there a case for arguing with the DWP that actually the tax credit system has worked pretty well, has taken a lot of children out of poverty, and given it doesn't seem to the evidence that I've heard so far, that the DWP are equipped to take on all of those uh, claimants over to the DWP, would it not be better to argue that we just leave the tax credit system alone, leave it with HMRC? Well, certainly we have on a, a number of occasions uh, written to the UK government, I think we're up to 11 letters um, now, to uh, strongly um, urge the DWP to halt the rollout of universal credit. We had yes, wished to do that um, before uh, this point, but now that we've uh, reached a, a very crucial stage where managed migration is, is the next challenge coming uh, along. Uh, as I said to the convener, there are a number of concerns, as the committee has heard, around the, the use um, of universal credit. And there are particular concerns around uh, the UK government's managed migration um, draft regulations uh, that they have still not listened to. I, I do not believe the, the evidence on, on the impact of that. So there's been a, a very strong call from the Scottish Government uh, to halt the, the rollout of universal credit so that managed migration does not happen and people do not move over um, from tax credits to the, the benefit system. Um, and indeed, I, I wrote to the, the new Working Pensions um, Secretary of State, Amber Rudd, um, within her first couple of days to impress upon that point again once again. But, but just to clarify, that was in relation to the whole of the, the full rollout of universal credit? Yes. It, well, it's to halt the rollout of universal credit. Yeah. I don't want to see one single more family or, or individual moving on to universal credit. Now, we are unfortunately reaching the stage where we've had the yeah, rollout of the live I, system, I, but I, I don't want to well, see I the management. I'm migration. on record as supporting the government on this, and I hope that's accepted, but it doesn't seem that that's going to happen by all accounts. And I just wondered, should we not have a plan B if we can't stop the halt of universal credit? Maybe there's parts of it we need to try and argue um, sensibly that uh, I could think of lots of areas like take self-employed people out of universal credit would help um, do away with a four-week uh, period to stop fluctuating earnings. Um, I've had my first case this week of a single parent family who are, have been in work, except for one week out of work, been in work for 30 years and have had zero, zero tax credits this month as a result of the mm. transition. So it just struck me as that maybe it's one thing to, if we're not going to get the whole of universal credit, maybe this. Uh, there might be some sense in the DWP, I don't know, to say, well, would we at least halt the transfer of tax credits would be at least save some families. 
Well, certainly there's, there should be a halt to that managed migration so that those on tax credits um, don't move over. The new Secretary of State has said she is listening. I have to take her at her word um, at this point that she has realised and has recognised that there are a number of concerns around universal credit. She has the opportunity to act and act quickly to, for example, um, change the draft regulations for managed migration to deal with uh, a number of the, uh, the still glaring uh, problems that are within managed migration. Now, if she does not and she insists in moving along with managed migration, then absolutely there are specific details within universal credit which we should look at to change. And my letter to the Secretary of State goes into a number of, of them in great detail. Uh, one um, example of the concerns about the managed migration, of course, is that tax credit recipients um, will also not benefit from that two-week run-on that was made so much of during the UK uh, budget process. Um, they will still need to claim their universal credit um, for that. For that, so there are a, a great number of very detailed, specific concerns around managed migration, and the Scottish government made a very detailed response on that. Um, but I will not give up um, because the evidence is so strong and the UN Rapporteur um, has once again reiterated the damage that's coming to universal credit that the new Secretary of State has an opportunity um, to act. She says she's listening and if she genuinely is listening, it won't take her long to hear um, the, the outcry from charities about the need to stop universal credit rollout full stop. Thank you. I'll leave that to later if you want. Okay, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll come back to some of that, Deputy Convener. Alistair Allen. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm interested to know to what extent the Scottish Government feels it's been involved in the development of the, the thinking, if we can call it thinking, um, behind some of these um, policies around uh, the rollout of universal credit, but particularly uh, around uh, the issue of, of sanctions for, for people who are in work. Obviously, most people's intuitive understanding of how you get from a, a low-paid job into a better-paid job involves training and, and opportunities and education. Uh, it doesn't normally involve being sanctioned into a better paid job or, or punished into a better paid job. So I just am curious to know to what extent along the way the Scottish Government feel they've really been asked their opinion about whether that even works. Um, well, I'm not sure we've been asked our opinion, but we've certainly given it at every um, opportunity um, around that. And that's because the, the evidence um, around um, the effectiveness of, of sanctions is very clear. Um, there's been, for example, um, a, a five-year longitudinal academic study um, which looked at sanctions um, and conditionality and it's, it concluded that it had, and I quote, universally negative impacts on people. Um, so the evidence is very strong that it, this isn't a way forward. When we're looking at what the Scottish Government um, and the attack the Scottish Government um, is doing, it is around um, upskilling, for example, through the Flexible Workforce Development Fund, um, through um, an attempt to encourage uh, better awareness of the opportunities that are out there but always on a voluntary uh, basis. And certainly the feedback that's coming back um, for the employability services, for example, that the Scottish Government is running and that voluntary way um, is ensuring that people feel supported and therefore that they will come back to their key worker and be supported in a process of upskilling or trying to get into the workforce. Um, and that is very different from feeling that they will have um, a, an adversarial uh, relationship in many cases with their, their work coach in the DWP. That is proven to be um, effective. And I think that the um, evidence that will come from the employability services around the Scottish Government will demonstrate that that's effective. And it's very clear um, that I've quoted one study out of many that sanctions do not um, encourage um, people to get into better paid employment. If you're, given the, the different starting points that the two governments clearly have on this, and you, you've mentioned um, how essentially devolved services are, are there to try to uh, provide opportunities for people to get into it to better work. How, what is the, or if, if there is any, what what is the um, the point of contact or the the, the point of engagement? How, how do devolved services engage 
to ensure progression of the type we're, we're talking about when the benefit system seems to be going in an opposite direction. How, how are devolved services geared up to cope with this, this difference in approach? Well, we made it very clear, for example, when um, the employability um, powers that we have, limited though they are, were devolved to the, the Scottish Parliament, that sanctions would play no part in that. Um, I mentioned that Mr Hepburn and myself um, attend joint ministerial working groups on this aspect, and there are a number of groups at official levels that look in that, where we are very specific and um, very definite in our a determination to not have sanctions happening. Uh, now, that therefore um, encourages people to get involved and to take part in services within Scotland in a way that I don't believe happens elsewhere in the UK. But I, I take the point that many people are still frightened of the overall system. Uh, they are fearful of sanctions in general. Um, and that, that fear of sanctions um, still does weigh heavily on many people, despite the reassurances that we can provide over the aspects um, where um, we are devolved. Finally, Convener, uh, you mentioned, uh, you quoted the UN Rapporteur in your opening remarks. I don't think you, you quoted some of the strongest things the UN Rapporteur had to, to say, but I'm curious to know where you feel the, the human impact um, of of this process that we're talking about, about uh, in work conditionality and some of the sanctions associated with it, what the, what the consequences are that you feel devolved services might have to pick up. Uh, the pieces around, given the fact um, that the, the rapporteur has said uh, British compassion for those who are suffering has been replaced by a punitive, mean-spirited and often callous approach. Um, does that apply to this area of, of uh, the role at Universal Credit? Well, I, I think the, um, the UN Special Rapporteur was exceptionally strong in his um, end-of-visit statement. Obviously, we look forward to his um, full report um, um, in the middle of, of next year. Um, I think Mr Allen is quite right to point to the fact that uh, services at a local authority level and Scottish Government level are picking up the pieces of what happens within universal credit. There is uh, no doubt in my mind that universal credit is um, causing anxiety, it's causing stress, it's causing increased rent arrears, it's causing an increased use of food banks. And um, it is therefore many of the devolved services and local authority services um, that are attempting to, 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 to fill in the gaps. Um, and of course, point out that it's many charitable organisations that are having to step in and fill the gap when people are being failed by the welfare system. I give one example. Uh, for example, at a local authority level that uh, the City of Glasgow Council are spending around £2 million um, trying to deal with the, the impact of universal credit coming to the city. Um, now, that's um, exceptionally concerning that local authorities are having to look at that level of funding. Um, and this at a time, of course, when the DWP have, in, of course, taken away the universal support payments that was given to local authorities uh, to help people um, and support them on their transition to universal credit. So there are a number of impacts at the Scottish Government level, local authority level um, and uh, within the charitable sectors uh, where there are financial impacts because um, other services are attempting to step up and assist people at times of crisis. Thank you. Uh, Shula Robinson. Good morning. Uh, I want to go back to managed migration, uh, if that's OK. Obviously, we'd all like Amber Rudd to, to think again and, and halt um, managed migration in relation to particularly people on tax credits. Tax credits. But if she ploughs ahead, um, the, you mentioned in your, your remarks earlier that uh, people will obviously need to apply, many of whom have no idea that this is coming. Um, the DWP said that they didn't envisage any attrition rates. How, what would your response to that be? And is there um, 
a way of monitoring that? Um, are there going to be systems in place that you're aware of that either the DWP or, or even third sector organisations will have in place to monitor whether or not people drop out of the system because they either don't know they should apply or feel that they're not part of, they don't want to be part of the benefit system? Well, this is um, an area of great concern. It was um, a particular area which the Scottish Government um, raised in our uh, response um, to SAC when it was looking at the, the regulations and when SAC then went back to the DWP. It was an area of specific concern and it's unfortunate that DWP have continued with this um, policy um, this policy direction of requiring people to apply for universal credit. Um, there, is, there is simply not enough um, being built into that transition that will reassure me, um, or indeed many others, that enough is being done to ensure people don't fall through the cracks, particularly those perhaps that are the most vulnerable in our society. Um, and this um, this is a major change for people. They they do not they have not been part of the benefits system before. Um, they will have little understanding that this is about to come their way, and yet the responsibility is being placed on that individual to ensure that they. Um, will apply for universal credit. And I don't think there's being enough done by the DWP to ensure that people don't fall through the cracks. There are ways where systems could be pre-populated, for example, with information, so that um, much more is being done to take that responsibility away from the individual and actually put it onto the system. Mm. Um, and that's, that's not happening um, in, in due course. Um, and I stress again, this isn't just the view of the Scottish Government. Yes, we did put that forward in our response to SAC, but actually um, very specifically SAC said that the risk should sit with the department and not with the individual. And I think that's the, the very least that people can expect um, out of such a major change um, to the tax credit benefit system. You made, you've made references to, to the, the draft regulations um, in the, um, a couple of times. And one of the issues that, that has emerged um, through the evidence session is the, the transitional protection that will be afforded to people migrating over. So, in essence, that their income will be protected unless there's a change of circumstances. And one of the concerns that the committee has heard is the change of circumstances could be um, a whole range of matters, but it also could include uh, a woman, for example, leaving a domestic violence situation. Now, when the DWP were here, we asked about discretion and whether, and we really didn't get any clear answer. So is it your understanding and uh, that that there will be any discretion? Um, what's your understanding of the draft regulations in that regard? And was that something that the Scottish Government included in your response about the need for discretion uh, in those circumstances? Because it, you know, really, the, it, we would never want a situation where a woman is making a decision not to flee violence because she's worried about the impact of income on her family. That would just be an intolerable situation. Well, there is a major um, concern that the transitional arrangements um, will not apply if there's a change of circumstances. Um, and as you quite rightly point out, a change of circumstance um, can, um, can happen for a myriad of different reasons, some of them very minor to, to an individual. And of course, they are obliged and um, required to, to notify of that change of, of circumstance. Um, and one of those is, of course, um, women fleeing domestic violence. Um, I think it would be fair to say at this point that there is not enough clarity around how transitional protection will work. Um, and that's uh, an area of concern that we have raised with the, the DWP, um, that until 
we can break this down and know how it will affect individuals, and particularly the most vulnerable individuals in our society, we should not have managed migration unless there can be a reassurance that people will not fall through a gap, that a woman will not stay in um, an abusive relationship because they're frightened about how much money that they're going to receive, then we simply shouldn't be going down this path. Now, the, as I say, the Secretary of State has said she's in listening mode. I, I hope she, that she is, uh, because there is much more qu clarity required, particularly around the protection of vulnerable people in our society. And we may disagree between the two governments about a policy direction on universal credit, and we will continue uh, to do so. But I sincerely hope that um, Amber Rudd will look at the very specific challenges that this is going to cause on some of the most vulnerable in our society and not in any way begin a process until she can guarantee people uh, that they will not be worse off in this system, particularly uh, in cases of, of domestic abuse. We simply can't get into a situation um, where that is something that's on a woman's mind um, at a point of crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Thanks Kavina. Um, when we're talking about um, in work poverty, um, in my mind, there's two ways of... Um, lifting people out of that and work poverty, and that is through increasing um, their wages through things like the, the minimum wage or by the, the state intervening to, to support people's incomes. And a good way of doing that, certainly as it was described when it was announced, is the, the government's plan for an income supplement. Um, I wonder if you're able to set out some of the um, early thinking around the income supplement and think about whether you have. Um, a particular target in mind for uh, poverty reduction, um, think about eligibility, level of payment, um, the date of implementation and um, a budget that you think you, you, you may be setting aside for that. Um, absolutely right that there are um, a number of ways to assist people um, out of poverty and one of the areas which the government is absolutely committed to is uh, the income supplement. There is a great deal of preparatory work going on to ensure that we look at, at what an income supplement could look like um, and all the, 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 um, the aspects um, that you mentioned there around looking at eligibility, um, looking at how uh, that would be funded, looking at um, how we could deliver that um, will be analysed and will be appraised. Uh, one of the um, particular aspects that we're keen to ensure that we're looking at um, as we look at income supplement is around the de delivery mechanism of income supplement as well uh, to ensure that we're doing that in a way that is both timely and is effective in that we don't spend so much money on the implementation of it that we're taking money away from what we would actually then pay as the income supplement. So all those aspects are being looked at. There are a number of um, meetings with stakeholders that are going on um, at that time, both at official level and um, at a cabinet secretary level. Uh, the policy lead uh, for this at a cabinet level obviously sits with Aileen Campbell, but the delivery may sit within um, my portfolio. So both myself and Ms Campbell have met with a number of stakeholders to discuss their views on the income supplement. And there is uh, preparatory work ongoing within government um, to uh, look at um, um, the feasibility of different delivery mechanisms and to appraise different options. Um, one of the, 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 um, the areas we'll be keen to look at is around the, the number of children that were... Um, that the Give Me Five campaign suggested that could be lifted out of poverty uh, by that uh, by that mechanism. Now, that's not a mechanism, of course, that the Scottish Government supported, uh, but it's a, a useful starting point for us to, to look at within that. Uh, so those, that stakeholder engagement is ongoing, as I say, both um, from a, a 
cabinet secretary level and, a, and an official level to ensure that we look at the delivery and um, all the various options that are available to, to, to drive that income supplement forward. Okay. That arrangement was made um, eight months ago. So when do you think you'd be looking to come back to, to Parliament? And particularly this, this committee would obviously have an interest um, with more details about the income supplement. And, well, and as well, just um, since we're talking about universal credit and the difficulties that um, that system presents, just what your view is on um, any reliance um, the income supplement would or would not have on the universal credit system? Well, we intend to ensure that we've reported back to Parliament um, in June on the options uh, that are going forward and obviously there will be a great deal of stakeholder engagement in that and we of course had our uh, debates in Parliament where we discussed um, the, the um, the opportunity for, for cross-party talks on this aspect as well. And it is an area where Ms Campbell and I are, are very keen to, to work um, with others in the Parliament to, to bring forward this policy. Um, we are, you raise a very um, interesting and I think important point about our reliability or, or our reliance on universal credits or um, a, a reserved benefit, for example. And I think our experience <clears throat> has shown that it is a, it's not easy to uh, have joint working with the DWP on many um, areas and that it's um, a very complex task. Um, I suppose the, the other aspect I'm very mindful of is the cost of delivery as well. And for example, when we're looking at Scottish choices, um, it's um, the cost to the Scottish government to the DWP per choice is £2.50. Uh, now, that's, um, that's a cost that the Scottish government um, um, puts out because we believe in um, having the Scottish choices there, but that's money, therefore, the Scottish government's not using on anything else. So our reliance on reserved benefits like universal credit obviously makes us uh, reliant on any changes to the universal credit system and how that may impact. And it also um, requires us to have a joint timetable with the DWP on how quickly that that could be introduced. And all of that, as I say, given the example from Scottish Coises, comes with a cost. Okay, you've touched on um, Scottish Choices and obviously there are two already in place and um, automatic split payments from what we heard from DWPs kind of at an advanced stage as well. I wonder if there's been any, if you really if you think the work around um, universal credit flexibilities on the Scottish Government side is at an end or are there any other um, aspects of universal credit that you would look to exercise Scottish powers to make um, changes in a similar way as the Scottish choices already um, have been implemented? Well, we have, our, um, we have very limited areas where we have any ability to, to impact on, um, on universal credit. Uh, the ability to have more frequent payments and the ability to pay direct to landlords are two which are, which are now in place. Uh, the two other aspects which um, are within Scottish Government powers is, of course, um, split payments and the bedroom tax. Um, unfortunately, the DWP have moved uh, the timetable for um, an introduction to the mitigation of the bedroom tax um, at source. Now, in the interim period, the Scottish Government will, of course, continue to mitigate from the bedroom tax uh, through discretionary housing payments. But it is disappointing that there has been a further delay at the DWP end to how we will deal with <clears throat> how we will deal with the bedroom tax um, at source. Had we wished to do, we are um, obviously also moving forward with our uh, policies around split payments. Um, but it's, uh, a right of an individual, I believe, to have a payment as an individual and not as a household. And the Scottish Government will be moving forward with our policy proposals on split payments um, this year. We will then, of course, have to 
um, work with the DWP to, on the implementation of that and, again, on how much that would cost the Scottish Government um, uh, within its workings with the DWP. So the, there are two other areas we're looking at. Uh, they are not in our gift when it comes to the timetable, uh, but certainly the policy intent and our determination to drive those forward um, is absolutely there. Very, very finally, Kamira, I wonder if, if it's in the, the Scottish Government's um, power to do this. I'm not entirely sure, but um, housing organisations who are um, supporting the, the Housing First um, model of um, social security payments, securing someone's tenancy before anything else, are advocating for use of um, automatic direct payments to landlords and giving a lent lever of uh, rent arrears we're seeing from local authorities, whether that's something the government would consider pursuing um, so that uh, those on universal credit have their uh, tenancy secured um, at the outset. Well, we, of course, through uh, Scottish Choices, um, encourage people to take up the option to pay direct to their landlord. Um, the choice is very important that it's that it's an individual's benefit and it should be an individual's choice how that will be used. Um, so I do believe that it should be up to an individual about how that payment is is made, whether it's direct to a landlord or not. Uh, I do recognise that there are <clears throat> a number of concerns uh, that uh, landlords have around the payments uh, that are going direct to them at the moment because of the way that the DWP payments um, happen. In effect, people are in technical arrears, and that's um, a concern, and that's something which I've spoken to uh, the SFHA about, for example, and we have made uh, a number um, of um, suggestions to the DWP about how those challenges for social landlords um, could be uh, could be dealt with, um, and it's, uh, the DWP could change the payment system to landlords to ensure that this technical arrear doesn't happen. Uh, but I do go back to the point that it's an, an individual person's benefit and for them to decide how that money um, goes forward. Uh, at, the moment, at the moment, it automatically goes to the individual, um, and then they have a choice to switch to direct payments. Is it possible to have the payment automatically go to the landlord, but still have the claimant to have the choice to revert to a payment to them? That would still give them a choice, but would automatically go to the, the landlord in the first instance? Um, you could put that policy forward, but I think um, it is important for the individual to have the choice and for them to decide how their payment is, is moved forward. So the preference is for the individual to have that choice uh, for them to then pay it direct to the landlord if that's what they wish to do, rather than it being an, an assumption and an op opt out of a choice, rather than an opt in. Okay, thanks, Camilla. Okay, Alison Johnson. You convener. Um, um, you may be aware, Cabinet Secretary, that the committee has written to local authorities asking them what financial provisions have been made in response to the rollout of universal credit. Um, Many of them, of course, mention the Scottish Welfare Fund, and um, that also comes up in submissions from other organisations. And um, I think it's, it wouldn't be unexpected that with the rollout of universal credit, there will be more demand on the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, and while I appreciate wholeheartedly that, that that fund and other payments and services like discretionary housing payment um, aren't and shouldn't be used simply to mitigate cuts, um, that have come directly from another government's policies, they are there to stop people falling into, you know, people who are struggling in really diff difficult circumstances, um, both working and out of work. So I'd just be interested to learn what the Scottish Government is doing to assist local authorities to deal with any rising demand for support. Well, it, it is quite right to say that local authorities um, are facing um, the challenge of trying to prepare people for the, the forthcoming rollout of universal credit um, in a managed migration sense. And of course, we've had a number of our largest cities moving forward with, uh, with universal credit in the last few months. Um, 
when you look at the Scottish Welfare Fund, for example, I'm uh, aware that uh, a, a large proportion of those that are coming forward for Scottish Welfare Fund uh, payments um, are doing so because of uh, a delay in a benefit being paid or indeed uh, the incorrect amount of benefit being paid and that is putting people into crisis. Now, when you look at why the Scottish Welfare Fund was set up, it was there for people in times of crisis. Um, it is unfortunately turning more and more into something that people are using uh, because of a failure in another part of the benefit system. So um, I know that there are um, uh, there are a, a, a large portion, as I say, of individuals that are now coming forward to the Scottish Welfare Fund because of um, the impact of, of universal credit as, as it moves forward. It's disappointing, as I mentioned um, earlier, that we've had uh, cuts, for example, to universal support provided directly to local authorities from the DWP um, recently. Um, but the area around... Um, how local authorities are being affected, whether it's the Scottish Welfare Fund or others, um, was an area that I, I met with um, COSLA recently to uh, discuss. And um, Councillor uh, Whitman and I um, agreed jointly that we would ensure that we have close communication from Scottish Government officials and from local authorities about the impact that it is having on local authorities so that we have an absolute awareness of that. Now, local authorities are at different stages uh, with that because they've had universal credit for uh, differing amounts of time across the country. Um, but um, we are very keen to work with COSLA to shine a light on the um, added burden that universal credit is uh, is bringing to, to local authorities. Uh, the DWP did... Um, uh, assure local authorities that they would um, provide additional funding for the administrative burden that universal credit would bring. Um, it would be fair to say that not much has come from that promise, and it's something which um, I'm very uh, keen to work with local authorities on. And will the government continue to monitor that situation with regard to funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund and DHPs? You know, just to ensure that local authorities are able to meet any demand that arises? Well, it's, it's certainly something which we do have to keep uh, a, a close eye on. Um, we are, obviously, when it comes to, for example, the, the Scottish Welfare Fund, the allocation with, um, between local authorities um, is um, a joint agreement that we have with COSLA about how that is allocated um, amongst the local authorities uh, based on um, SIMD figures, um, and that is a, a jointly agreed um, formula. Uh, the aspects around the Scottish Welfare Fund discretionary housing payments are, of course, a matter um, which are um, for the determination of the Scottish budget as we move through our annual process. Okay. Um, a, a common theme... Um a common suggestion in written submissions was to ask for more funding for advice services. Um, I'm aware the, the financial health check has just been launched this month. Um, and Citizens Advice will, will have responsibility for that. But CPAG, Citizens Advice, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, um, Menu for Change, you know, many organisations, you know, have in their submissions pointed out that ensuring people have access to information and advice to enable them to maximise their incomes, to make sure they know what they're entitled to um, and where to get it, is key. Um, so I'd just like to understand what efforts are being making, uh, what efforts are, are, are being taken to ensure that people do have an opportunity to maximise their income, because we know, you know some of the figures about the amount of unclaimed benefits are quite staggering and could make a, a real difference to people. Well, uh, absolutely, and um, the committee and, um, and Alison Johnson in particular will be aware of the responsibility that the Scottish Government has to, for example, um, um, increase the level of take-up for benefits under the Social Security Act, and it's one of the reasons for that absolutely is because of the, um, the fact that so much goes unclaimed. 
um, and it is absolutely imperative that we do look very seriously um, at income maximisation. Um, I do absolutely um, agree, see at a constituency level and a, and a ministerial level, the um, importance of having um, a, a well-funded um, advice service. And I, I see, as I'm sure other members do, the, the, uh, the impact that, that that can have on people. Um, we have, of course, increased our uh, welfare advice services budget from £3.1 million in 2017-18 to 3.6 million in 2018-19 to enable us to improve our um, support for uh, advice in recognition of the very important role that that plays. Um, the financial health check that was recently uh, launched by Aileen Campbell is uh, another important aspect uh, within our commitment to ensure that people have um, the information that they require to, to to get that benefit take up that they, they are um, that they are entitled to, and obviously to deal with the poverty premium that many people um, unfortunately face, uh, we have undertaken also within government a review of uh, the advice services uh, because. Uh, there's uh, many different parts of government that actually fund different advice services. Um, some come through Ms Campbell's portfolio, uh, but not all. And we need to ensure that we're not duplicating anything and actually causing more work to the advice services in terms of budding for different pots in different parts of government. And therefore, we're making it more difficult uh, for us to support them. So that works uh, ongoing as well to ensure that we are funding them in an effective way and not in effect jumping uh, through hoops to try and get different funding pots from different parts of government to do the joint part of what we all want to do, which is to, to um, have income maximisation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. OK. George Adam. Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Many of the written submissions we had uh, came with suggestions for the Scottish social security system and how they could mitigate against uh, the universal credits. Now, it almost feels as if it's a case of uh, Westminster Tory government kind of breaks it and you've got to fix it every time. Even so, even to the UN Special Rapporteur's intern findings last week where he said, through it all, one actor has stubbornly resisted seeing the situation for what it is. The government, the UK government, has remained determinedly in a state of denial, even while devolved authorities in Scotland and Northern Ireland are frantically trying to devise ways to mitigate, or in other words, counteract, at least the worst features of the government's benefits policy. You know, even Alison Johnson, uh, my colleague Alison Johnson, said in a recent debate, and I agree with her in this, that she didn't come here to this parliament to mitigate against another uh, government's uh, policy. Now, my question after all that is effectively, you know, when do you stop cleaning up after the Westminster Tory government? Well, I think it is undoubtedly a challenge that this, the Scottish Government has. I, I mentioned in my opening remarks about the sheer scale of the cuts, £3.7 billion, and the comparison, uh, to put that into perspective, about it being three times the annual uh, police budget within Scotland. Now, that, at that level of expenditure, and I've, I've read uh, a great deal of the written evidence uh, that the committee has had around suggestions of the Scottish Government to take action. Um, and I fully appreciate um, and understand where they're coming from. I looked at that long list of suggestions for the Scottish Government to, um, in effect, pick up the pieces from Westminster. Um, and, and again was concerned about the, the ability for the Scottish Government to be able to fund all those. In saying that, however, we will not stand by and do nothing while people are unable to, uh, to feed their families or feed themselves because of what's happening down there. We won't stand by and, and allow that to happen. Um, I simply make the point that we cannot pick up the piece of every welfare cut that's happening. At, at Westminster. I mentioned in my opening statement around uh, the £125 million that we spend on mitigation measures. Um, that is uh, broken down by the Scottish Welfare Fund, the Discretionary Housing Payments and the Fairer Scotland Fund. What that doesn't, of course, include is what goes on across the rest of government to support those on low incomes. 
I mentioned some of that in my opening remarks around school clothing grants, sanitary products, but could also mention um, the educational maintenance um, allowance, uh, the £96 million overall to support Fair Start Scotland, um, the Workplace Equality Fund, Council Tax uh, Reduction. Uh, I, I could go on. There is a, a number of lists within other ministerial portfolios um, that also supports those uh, that are on low incomes. Uh, but this committee and others will be well aware of the challenges uh, at this time where we are starting to look at Scottish Government budgets about everything that we are having to do to mitigate the worst excesses of Westminster policy decisions. And the UN Rapporteur was very specific in saying that these were policy choices. They weren't by accident. Uh, they didn't happen because of hysterity. means that um, that's a budgetary challenge that we have to take on board within the Scottish Government. And that sits very heavily within my portfolio, but also as I suggest, by the number of um, other projects that are going on across government, sits very heavily on the desks of uh, uh, my colleague cabinet secretaries as well. These are extremely strong words uh, from the UN Rapporteur with regards to that. Surely, surely even now when we're looking at it, and I'm, I'm going off on a tangent to a certain degree, but surely when we're looking at it here, it's almost as if even the UN are saying we should be looking at uh, if the Scottish Government have got to make these decisions. Surely if we had the full powers of uh, Social Security, we could actually make a better chance of it than what we're currently getting through the Westminster Government. Well, I, I go back to the point that these are policy choices that are being made by the DWP and by the UK government. Um, it's nothing to do with austerity that we sanction people within the UK welfare system. And it's nothing to do with austerity that we have a two-child cap policy. Uh, these are policy decisions that have been taken. And I think when you look at the devolution of uh, the limited amount of social security payments that we will have in here, around 15%, people will begin to see that it can be different. Um, when you look at the, the dignity, fairness and respect that we will deliver through the benefits that will be devolved, there will be a demonstrable comparison between two systems within the UK, one delivered on dignity, fairness and respect, and the other one, which not my words, but the words of the people that I speak to, uh, when I go out and visit, is inhumane. And I think that will be a very stark comparison for people to draw their own conclusions from in due course. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, you mentioned sanctions there, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And I, I suppose we went full circle a little bit, because I'm, I'm just going to ask a little bit about our original line of, of questioning before we move on, because it made me think about sanctions myself. And I think Alistair Allen had explored the point about in work conditionality, which we would probably call sanctions, you know, um, um, rather than making work pay, making work punitive, if, if, if you like. But, but myself and Alice Al had explored the line of questioning, which was in terms of work progression and in terms of career progression, the Scottish Government's got a role to play in terms of uh, the further higher education sector for training people uh, in relation to apprenticeships, in relation to childcare. Uh, even in relation to transport links in local communities and I'd better understand local jobs markets. There's a huge overlap uh, between tiers of government, Scottish government, UK government and local authorities. And I'd been asking about um, how you could work closer together in relation to supporting work progression. And you had indicated you'd be prepared to do that. But just when sanctions came up there, to, to work on a more formal basis in relation to work progression vis-a-vis -vis universal credit system, would the UK government have to lift the threat of sanctions uh, to those in work that are universal credit? Because if they didn't lift that threat, could it do reputational damage to local authorities and to the Scottish government if they got so close to the DWP to be working hand in glove with them to support work progression? But actually, ironically, at the end of that, there could be a sanction. Well, I think, it's, um, I think it's very important that we see it from the perspective of the individual who's, who's going through this process. And I suppose I would stress the, the key role that uh, the support worker has, for example, around Fair Start Scotland, 
where there's a, a person that an individual going through that process can go to for advice and for reassurance about what's going on. Now, all of that counts for nothing if a person in another part of the system is being concerned about um, a sanction. Uh, but it is important that the work that we are doing uh, supports people. And uh, again, I give the example of, of Fair Start Scotland about what, what that's um, all about. When we're looking at the people that are in in-work conditionality, um, that it is it, that are in work and, and may face uh, sanctions, it is very difficult for them to feel, in fact, I would say impossible for them to feel supported during that process. Um, people are being sanctioned to try and get uh, more hours or a better paid job that may not exist in their local labour market. Um, and it, it's not really the responsibility of that individual to work out who's to blame for that. Um, it's the responsibility as much as we can within local authority and within Scottish Government to ensure that, that they know about the services that are out there. Uh, but it is a challenge for people to work through a system that's uh, very complex. OK, I, I suppose, Cabinet Secretary, and I'll, I'll, I'll just ask a brief follow-up to that. I won't push it much more. My thought was, like, so I, I represent Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn. There'll be, well, not in Mary Hill, the job centre's closed in Springburn. There'll be work coaches there who maybe in a few years' time are having to have conversations with uh, part-time workers about increasing their hours or increasing their rates of pay. The, there will be a skill shop. There, there's, a, there's a college there. Uh, there's a variety of supports that are of a devolved fashion. Um, and the more formal those relationships are with Job Centre Plus, the more there could be, dare I say it, a contamination of the positive relationship that local authorities and the government, Scottish Government is trying to build if you work so closely with Job Centre Plus for a system which ultimately could have a sanction at the end of it. So any localised formal arrangements with Job Centre Plus in relation to supporting those in work and in universal credit, would they have to lift the threat of sanctions over those individuals before you could have those formalised local relationships? Um, I suppose it would depend on the, the type of formalised local relationships that, that are in place. I mean, at all points, we would encourage a, a user-centred approach that's looking at it, as I said at the beginning, um, of your remarks from the individual's perspective. Uh, but I would also encourage DWP to take part in um, partnerships or groups within their communities because they can't be seen to be sitting separate to what goes on because there is then an inability for uh, charities, for colleges, for example, to know who exactly to pick up the phone to within DWP to be able to sort out a very localised problem. So the DWP can't sit and should never sit separate to what's going on within their communities. They need to actually have a recognition of what's happening there. That's certainly the aspect that we are building into the local delivery of Social Security Scotland, where the local delivery will be seen as part of the community and work with the partners that are already there, rather than sitting separate to that. And unless we have those local relationships, we can never expect people to have a true understanding about the impact of the decisions they're making, either within um, a job centre um, or within our local delivery service. Thank you. Um, Polly McNeill. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you about passported benefits. Um, so you know that there's a qualifying criteria for many passport benefits, including the receipt of universal credit with income below a certain threshold. So th there's a lot of different issues arise from that. Uh, the one I wanted to ask you about was eligibility for free school meals. Can I begin by saying <laughs> I've done a bit of work on this over the last couple of years and it's taken me a long time <laughs> to actually understand how we arrive at the current threshold and who qualifies is a very complex um, arithmetic, being on tax credits and working tax credits and being below a certain earnings threshold. So um, in some ways I suppose this is a simpler simpler to understand. So the 
So, in, to, in relation to the earnings limit and application for those on universal credit in relation to free school meals, then the figure is £610 in the monthly assessment period immediately prior to the application for free school meals. So, it's £610. So, if I could just read out the bit from Spice. Um, Few families on working tax credit would have earnings low enough to benefit from these rates. For example, in 2019-2020, the national living wage for people over 25 will be 8.21. So someone would need to be working fewer than 18 hours a week at the rate of eight of eight pounds twenty one in order to fall within this six hundred and ten pounds a month threshold for a free school meal. So I, I have no idea how that compares to the current arrangements, um, and I wouldn't I ex expect you to have the answer at the top of your head. However, um, I wondered if any thought, if plan to put any thought into um, what would be within your gift in terms of the powers of this Parliament to change that threshold, um, and how how you see that earnings limit application impacting on families that need to rely on on free school meals? Sure. Well, um, as as uh, the deputy convener rightly points out, the rules around passport and benefit are are very complicated, um, and it's a policy area that um, sits within many different ministerial portfolios. The specific one uh, she mentions obviously sits within education rather than specifically um, around uh, social security. And as such, the criteria for uh, the benefits um, sit within different ministerial um, portfolios. Um, when we're looking at the eligibility um, of that, there is an awareness across government that the move to universal credit is creating a challenge for passported benefits. Um, now, as, as the committee well knows, there are challenges, for example, around the fact that UC fluctuates from month to month, um, and that creates difficulties for, um, for individuals when we're, we're looking at that. So um, within the different ministerial por portfolios, we are... Um, actively considering the impact of universal um, credit. The decisions that will come from that will sit with the different ministers um, that are um, involved um, with that. And as I say, the, the free school meals obviously um, sits for the Cabinet Secretary for Education. Um, but the, the challenges that um, universal credit are um, are, are um, playing out for individuals is something which, across government, we're, we're live to. Um, can I just follow up? Um, so, uh, absolutely, um, it's another minister's responsibility. But by right in saying that it would be within the gift of the Scottish Government to change the threshold for free school meals if they chose to do that? So, the eligibility for, mm -hmm. for free school meals is, is set within regulations uh, that are devolved, indeed. So, it would be up to uh, the, the cabinet secretary responsible for that for that area in this case uh, for education uh, to look at that and I again would stress that um, that across government we are aware of the challenges particularly around universal credit and the impact that that will have yes. and I wondered if it if it was possible um, to consider getting back to the committee or perhaps we, we might choose to write to the um, Cabinet Secretary for Education. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is whether that £610 is a lower threshold than the one we're already operating. I suspect it probably is a bit lower and it would, it would be helpful to know the, the, the answer to that. I mean, anyway... Um, okay. it, it, certainly, my understanding is it replicates the status quo, so it's not a, a lowering um, of that. But again, if the committee requires further information than I, than I have at hand to date, then we'd be happy to provide that in writing in due course. Thank you very much. Right. Cabinet Secretary, I think that would be, that would be really helpful, because as Deputy Commissioner was, <laughs> was asking the, the question, I had the benefit of, of 
going online to get some of the information in relation to current eligibility criteria within the tax credit system, which is not in the gift of yourself as you're sitting answering uh, the question, but even just reading some of the information from that. So if you have King's household tax credit and working tax credit paid at the maximum rate with household income for tax credits purposes under £6,420 with effect from April 2010, and it goes on and says some other information as well. I know one of the calls we got and evidence was irrespective of what the passported benefits regime is or isn't. Certainly that contrast between what it was before universal credit and what it is now with fluctuating earnings, for example, meaning it does recreate <laughs> cliff edges for passported benefit entitlement, but actually having all the information for all passported benefits reliable and in the one place and easy to understand language was, was some of the calls we've had. So that's maybe something that would be would be helpful as well, Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I certainly do um, take on board and, and uh, you know, I, I agreed with the Deputy Convener. It's a, it's a complex issue. It's made even more complex just now because of the moves um, around to, to universal credit. But it is something that we are... Um, that we are giving active consideration to across government. I would give um, a, an example from my own portfolio about what we're doing around Best Start grants, uh, for example, where we recognise that fluctuating income and therefore um, look at the Universal Credit Award um, in the month of application or the month before to ensure that um, if either of those are above a zero rating, then assistance can be given. So there, there has to be a, a recognition and an understanding of, of that. And that's um, the reasons why, for example, around Best Start Grant, we've, we've looked to, to uh, deal with that fluctuation in, in income and the challenges that presents to people. OK, thank you. Before I move on, uh, Michelle Ballantyne, I'm just wondering, you've not had the opportunity to ask a question <laughs> like yet. Would you like to ask anything? Not at the moment, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, well, if, if no other members wish to ask a question, just now there's one question I think we, we really do need to ask, because uh, one of the large determinants of inward poverty are rates of pay. So that means we have to look at the minimum wage and we have to look at the living wage we have to look at the uptake of the living wage and we have to look at that ongoing debate and discussion over whether um, the, the current minimum wage should actually be the current living wage and it should be statutory enforceable across the board. Whether that power sits in Scotland or the UK, that it should just happen, that's a pretty well-established view with many, many anti-poverty groups who are concerned about in-work poverty. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in your capacity as a Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and older people, whether you've made representations of that nature uh, to your counterparts at Westminster and what you're doing to promote the living wage in Scotland? Uh, well, it would be something for uh, another minister uh, rather than myself, but it is an area where we have um, repeatedly raised our concerns, for example, around the fact that we have... Uh, different aged individuals in their country receiving different minimum wages and the fact that if you're doing a job you should get um, the same pay regardless of what your age is so the fact that we have different minimum wages uh, for people depending on their age is is a great concern uh, obviously uh, as you rightly point out convener that the, the living wage is is something um, which the Scottish Government is keen to uh, promote. Um, I would uh, suggest that we're uh, leading the way on, on fair pay and we have the best performing of all the four UK countries in terms of paying the real living wage um, and would like to see the minimum wage being increased uh, to the level of the living wage. OK. Um, and finally... Uh, we've got a note in our, our, our briefing in relation to a uh, council tax uh, reduction. Uh, um, and a, a person's universal credit calculation is used to calculate entitlement to council tax reduction. Uh, I understand that there are some flexibilities with Scottish local authorities being able to project income over a year, despite the fact there's fluctuations in, in universal credit. And I'm just wondering if you're aware of any issues in relation to universal credit and the current 
council tax reduction scheme, which is obviously the management of that is actually uh, devolved. Um, and whether or not, if there are any concerns in relation to that, you have had or intend to have any discussions with either local authorities or the UK government. Uh, so this is an area that sits within the portfolio of, of Mr Mackay, but I'm uh, aware that uh, there are uh, the work that would happen to review the council tax reduction scheme is, is uh, rather being hindered by some of the uncertainty around the DW Please plans to, to migrate those um, in legacy benefits. That's particularly because um, of the, the aspect that I mentioned in a, in a previous answer around the lack of detail around transitional protection arrangements. Um, because that will clearly have an impact on how council tax reduction schemes uh, would work in practice. Uh, so this is um, obviously a concern that that uh, level of detail isn't available to uh, officials uh, within Scottish Government because it makes it very difficult to therefore work out what the implications to the council tax reduction scheme would be because we don't know how the transitional um, arrangements will work with universal credits. So it is um, an area, again, we are stressing that we require further detail on to allow us to fully fulfil our obligations to have um, a, an effective council tax reduction scheme in place uh, within our devolved powers. Okay, thank you very much. Well, all that remains, I don't see any other bids for questions from uh, members, is to thank yourself and your officials for your attendance this morning. I should, I suppose, put on the record that we had hoped this morning's witness session would include yourself and uh, your UK counterpart, who would have been up until a few days ago, uh, Esther McVeigh, but Ms McVeigh hadn't got back to accept her. Otherwise, an invite of her junior minister had accepted an invite, but that will not now happen to the new year. Uh, but we had hoped that we'd have been able to have both Scottish and UK government representatives here this morning. I think it's only fair to put that on the record. So thank you, Cabinet Secretary, to you and your officials. And we now move to agenda item three. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, uh, which is decision to take item in private. And the committee is asked to agree that the following items for consideration at its next meeting are taken in private. And they are, and I'll read through all three of them, consideration of a draft letter to the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People on the Young Carer Grant, consideration of an issues paper for the Social Security and, and Work Poverty Inquiry, and a work programme discussion. Is the committee agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we now move to agenda item four, which has previously agreed to uh, have in private. So we now move into private session. Thank you.